Okay. Welcome back from uh, break. Hopefully you all actually had one. It is nice to do something at least a little different every once in a while. So we're going to pick up on the on the last slide we were on uh, in the previous portion of this uh, this semester. Uh, since I'm not going to expect you to have remembered it across a week of whatever exciting activities you have done. So last we were talking about inclusivity. So we have multiple levels of a cash hierarchy. Uh, there's there's some new properties to think about. And uh, when we did go over this, I want to go over it one more time with I just emphasize that inclusivity is not a constant property of an entire memory hierarchy, but is a set of relationships between different levels of that hierarchy. All right, so let's, uh, let's do a little chalk here. Uh, that loss of generality, imagine a world where I have a main memory, L3, and L2, and an L1, you probably got a split L1, you probably got some other stuff going on there. Good enough, right? Um, so if we're talking about inclusivity, or you might have an inclusive memory hierarchy where the inclusivity property holds at every level. So in that case, the uh, L3 is a subset of, of the main memory, the L2 is a subset of the L3, the L1 is a subset of the L2. It would be a fully inclusive hierarchy all the way down. You may have a property where the uh, L1 is a subset of the L2, but the relationship between the L2 and the L3 is more complex. Right? It may not be a proper subset. It may be exclusive. Maybe whatever you want. Uh, the one thing you will see hold almost, uh, well, I can, I can think of no architecture where it does not hold. Uh, all of these, right, any data in any of the caches, will be uh, a subset of, of main memory. There will be nothing in the caches that is not in main memory. So with respect, uh, respect suddenly, uh, suddenly became Australian there. Um, with, uh, with, with respect to uh, main memory, uh, everything is inclusive. So cache is inclusive with respect to main memory, but the relationship among multiple levels of the cache can be variable in any particular design. Okay. Uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, space in the, in the design. And there, and there may be reasons for this because Inclusivity choices will turn out to not be orthogonal to other uh, design optimizations that we apply, right? So uh, we're not gonna dwell enormously on inclusivity, but I want you to remember that you have choices here about how you're gonna run the inclusivity of your cache as we look at other things that we're going to do in either the cache optimization space uh, or later when we get to uh, coherence. Right, so that's where the interactions and the design choices are going to become a little, a little clearer. Right, so there are already some forward pointers here. Right, uh, so interactions with write through, et cetera. Now, if we have inclusivity, if we have subsets, then we do have redundancy. Right, redundancy is not always a bad thing. Right, so let me give you the reason why this is a nice uh, pairing for a write through L1 for it to be have inclusivity property between the L1 and the L2. If my L1 is right through, there's always somewhere to write the data into in my L2. I don't have to worry about a, a right through here causing a miss here and some sort of cascade. Right? So inclusivity is very natural if it's right through. It's right back, I don't care as much. And right? I have more options. Okay. Now, exclusivity is something that has been used. Um, if you think about it, let's go with a, a simple example here. Um, so again, I'm, I'm sort of leaving out all of the other cores here, so ignore those for the moment. Um, if you look at, say, 2008-era Nehalem, there's a pretty standard pattern for what Intel actually did for the next, uh, the next, you know, eight, eight plus years. Um, then the scale of this is about 32K, 256K, and, you know, 8 MB. Again, lots of sharing here, ignore that for the moment. Uh, so, you didn't get a whole lot of extra bang for your buck by making these exclusive. The marginal gain in total capacity was pretty small, right? So exclusivity was not a huge goal. There certainly have been designs where these ratios, rather than being, you know, eight to one, uh, or you know, even more, uh, were much closer. And if you start to get ratios down to around maybe four to one, right? Then uh, then exclusivity starts to look uh, fairly attractive. 
Uh, you don't necessarily give up 25% of your cache capacity just to store redundant copies of data. Um, but at any rate. <clears throat> okay. So the issue that this, uh, this, this interacts with, as I said, and this is the right way to think about where inclusion is going to uh, going to enter into your subsequent calculus, right? Inclusion doesn't show up directly in any formula. It shows up indirectly in terms of understanding how things are going to cause traffic, right? So uh, any particular inclusion policy takes some effort to maintain, right? So if I need to know that anything in my L1 must be in my L2, there's some notion of tracking across layers that has to happen. If, uh, in contrast, I am enforcing a strictly exclusive policy, uh, I might be causing a lot of data movement. All right, so an exclusive policy, I'm going to be swapping lines between my L2 and my L1 right, anytime I have a miss in my L1. All right, so an exclusive policy, right, it can only be one or the other. So if I get a hit in the L2, it doesn't stay there. It has to migrate to the L1, but it can't be in both places. So the L1 has to move to the L2. Right? Lots of data movement and exclusivity. As we saw for the break, Data movement is expensive in terms of energy, right? This is expensive potentially in terms of metadata or in terms of policy enforcement, right? So let's say I have an inclusive hierarchy all the way down, right? I get rid of some line in L3. I now have to go out and make sure that that line is also gone from the L2, also gone from the L1, right? I've entangled everything together if I do strict inclusion, uh, which is why, again, in practice, uh, your Intel designs and uh, some other modern designs don't do strict inclusion across the entire hierarchy, right? It causes a lot of bookkeeping. Okay, so let's, let's not even worry about the particulars here. Um, there can be some other fun ones that, 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 that also occur uh, with strict inclusion. Uh, when you start thinking about split L1, iCache, and dcache, where you can have a pattern that is you know, very nicely sized for your, your data caches and the blocks of the matrix you're working on, but uh, you end up kicking out your instructions, right? Weird stuff can happen. So let's not think about it too, too much. Okay, so what we do need to think about and what is gonna actually show up in terms of uh, <laughs> concrete questions you can assess is AMAC, right? the average memory access time. All right, so the things you need to think about here are the access time, the miss rate, and the miss penalty. All right, the access time and the miss rate are specific to a particular cache level, All right? And the miss penalty is a function of the rest of the memory hierarchy. All right. So in general, um, you're gonna get a fair bit of mileage out of uh, adding some more levels, and we'll show you a simple example here. Let's say that I've got a one cycle access L1. Just going to get a unified model here. We'll imagine sim similarly that this is just entirely your, your, your data. Doesn't really matter. Uh, not going to worry too much about averaging your instruction data for the moment. We have a separate addendum for that. So one cycle per access, right? So there's always a hit time. So your AMAT uh, is always going to take into account how long it takes to get that data. Some of these accesses are going to be hits. Some of them are not. So some fraction of the accesses. Again, we're not doing this per instruction. We're doing this per access. It's average memory access time. If I don't access memory, I don't care. Right. So per access to memory, some fraction of these are misses. And then every one of these has some fixed miss penalty. So let's say this is my, uh, you know, keep all the numbers simple. Right. This is my main memory. I have a one level cache. We do a two level cache. And now let's take a look at some, some features here. So this is still going to be the same, right? My one cycle access doesn't change. My miss rate in that doesn't change. I haven't changed my L1 cache. I was adding a new layer. So basically what I'm doing is I'm substituting for this piece. I'm substituting the miss penalty for a expanded version of the miss penalty with more caches, right? So as I add caches, that is progressively what I'm doing. This whole piece here used to be 50. So then the goal should be, I need to replace it with something that is less than 50. If I replace it with something that is larger than 50, I have failed. 
right? Now, 10 cycles per access to L2. So it's going to take a lot longer to access these bigger caches. They are further away physically, right? Speed of uh, electrical signal propagation is finite, right? Uh, now, you'll note that the local miss rate here is going to be higher. There are going to be multiple reasons for this, right? So why might the miss rate in your L2, L2 is a bigger cache. Why might the local miss rate in your L2 be higher than in your, in your L1? So let's say this was a 32K here, 256K here. And yet, this is a 5X higher. Right, so you're, you're only looking for things that didn't have great locality that was captured by the, the L1. Uh, so uh, they, they presumably have some worse general uh, hashability, or else they'd have already been in your L1 in the first place. Right? So if you want to use the you know, making sandwiches analogies, right? Um, you know, all the stuff that was just you know, sitting there in your fridge or already on the counter, right? That, that's, that's all the common stuff. And every once in a while, you go, oh, well, yeah, I don't remember if we even have that. I got to go look in the pantry. Go out in the garage in the freezer. Right? It's not for the stuff that you're using every day, or else it wouldn't be in the freezer in the garage in the first place. It'd already be sitting right in front of you. Okay. So they're going to have worse patterns that they're trying to, trying to extract locality from, but they're not going to do as good a job because there's less of a job to be done. Okay, but if you add all this up, this is a win. Now, as I said, though, uh, if you ever replace this with something that is more than 50, you have lost. All right? So think about taking this to its logical extreme. Taking this to the logical extreme is, is a good way of, of thinking about spaces that you're designing. Look at the edges. Right? So here's your generate. Uh, you have uh, one cache. You could go even further. No cache. Right? So if you have no cache in the system, your average memory access time is pretty straightforward. It's 50. If you have no cache, this is really, really bad. It's 25 times worse. You do not want this. Remember, slower is worse, is bad. Don't, don't make the machine slower. That's not how you optimize. OK, so no cache, 50, that's terrible. Even one level of cache, much better. Two levels of cache, we got better. So now let's say that we want to add another level of cache. What part of this equation changes? If I add another level of cache to this, what part do I replace with an expanded expression? Just the 50, right? Just the miss penalty of the last layer of, of, this, of this process, right? So if you start thinking about at what point, right, is this going to be not a good idea? Well, okay, let's say I went from uh, one cycle per access from L1, 10 cycles from L2. Let's say maybe I now go to 30 cycles for my L3. What does my hit rate have to be for my L3, right? that this is still a win versus going to main memory, right? The requirements for hit rate versus the access time are going to start interacting. Let's say I go all the way to an L4, L3, L4, L5, L6. At some point, you're like, look, if I'm mostly missing anyway, I'm just taking longer to eventually get to here, right? If I did one cycle to check my L1 plus 10 cycles to check my L2 plus 30 cycles to check my L3, I've already spent 41 cycles. Right? Out of the 50, it would have taken me to just go to memory directly. So if I'm missing at this point, right, it's not so good. Because right? I just turned what could have been 50 into 91. Right? So in practice, the back pressure on uh, deeper and deeper levels of caches right, has to do with whether or not you're actually going to get any value out of them. Right? So this is still a 90% hit rate locally in your L2. This is still not bad. Right? It's not 98. 98 is amazing, right? but it's still 90. Right? If you start to get from you know, 0.1 misses to 0.1 hits, uh, well, right, you may be walking down the wrong path. So eventually, you will, uh, an AMAT will tell you this, uh, you will not want to add additional layers of cache, or you won't want to have a standard traditional lookup pattern. So uh, we will not cover this. So take 530 if you want to look at it. Um, but you can, uh, with a little bit of cleverness and some one-sided filters, 
uh, for, for correctness, uh, skip over layers of caches and predictively uh, bypass. All right, so if you do have a very deep cache hierarchy, you can still make that actually work by predicting that in fact, some things are going to be misses, bypass the entirety of that cache hierarchy if you know it is safe to do so. Uh, bloom filters are your friend here. How many people have heard of bloom filters? Okay, how many people have heard of hash tables? Okay, great. So think about a hash table uh, where uh, every bucket is just a bit that is set or not set, right? Uh, I don't know if your particular item, I don't have a way to actually check the quality if your actual element is there, but I can check if it's not there, All right? So if I check the bit and the bit is zero, then nothing that hashes to that bucket has ever been encountered, right? And you know that nothing is there. If it's a one, something, possibly many somethings, you don't know. Uh, but bloom filters are used for one-sided structures. They're nice, they're cheap. You can have counting bloom filters instead where you just count the number of objects and you can actually delete things. At any rate, uh, bypass properties are possible. This can get nice and gloriously complex, but we're going to stick with the uh, relatively simple version of this. Right? <clears throat> In fact, even if you think about just mislevel parallelism uh, already, you can see that this is uh, a, a, a simplified model. OK. So let's, let's do something uh, a little fun here. Let's, let's ponder how this would actually help you make design decisions. OK. So consider a series of systems, Skynet 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, n. All right. Clearly, you can stop with the, the version that actually finally just launches global thermonuclear war and exterminates most of the human race, but you know. Um, and uh, so the series of systems you're building, and they differ only in uh, their cache size. OK, so they're otherwise identical. So Skynet 1 has twice as much cache as Skynet 0. Skynet 2 has twice as much cache as Skynet 1, et cetera. And we've got a small number of workloads that we are going to run on these machines. And we do have one uh, reference workload, which is the always hits workload. So we do have some idea of how something that always hits on a cache uh, works. Okay. And let's say we describe them thusly. So foo. Uh, has pretty similar performance to always hits on Skynet Zero, and as you go to larger and larger capacity models, its performance degrades slightly. Bar uh, doesn't actually work very well in Skynet Zero to Three, uh, works pretty darn well in Skynet Four, and then slowly degrades a little bit thereafter. Uh, Baz is, is pretty much junk on Skynet Zero, uh, but gets progressively better the more cash you put on your Skynet model. Okay. Now, you can ask some, 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 some different questions here. You can ask, what are the likely properties of FUBAR and BAS? Right, that's an interesting thing to start to think about in terms of program behaviors that would cause these caching effects. But you can also think of this from a hardware design perspective. Right? So if I've got some mix of FUBAR and BAS, right, if I have to run all three of these, right, I'm not designing a machine just to run Foo, just to run BAR or BAS, but some mix of FUBAR and BAS. What's the right cache size? Is there going to be one that makes all of them happy? Well, I mean, yeah, it's an optimization problem. I can find the you know, least bad version, the one that makes pisses them off the least. right? But it's pretty clear that each of these actually wants a different size cache. Right? Now, if I'm building my successor series, Shodan, because I like my evil AI with you know, a, a, a slightly different touch. Any people familiar with Shodan? Shodan, System Shock, System Shock 2. Okay. Classics, classics. You all know Skynet though, right? Everyone knows. Okay, remember the first, the first line of all, all AI uh, build, model building is don't be Skynet. That's I think first, your first stipulation. Um, so if you were designing a hash hierarchy though, could you, could you meet all these needs, right? Could you design a cache hierarchy that is going to do a pretty good job of giving each of uh, the executions of FUBAR and BAS what they want from one machine? How'd you go about doing that? What would that cache hierarchy probably look like? So how do I make Foo happy?
I know, I'm anthropomorphizing. Who is a program? Programs aren't going to be happy. Not a trick question. How do, I, how do I make the person who needs food to run well happy, right? How much cash does food need? Not much, right? Okay, great. Uh, I know that uh, my should end zero amount of cash is enough to get make food, uh, food great, so I'm going to make that my L1, right? How much cash does bar need? It needs, uh, it needs Skynet 4 level of cash. I think I can make that my L2, right? I'll pay a little bit of a penalty versus just directly having that as my, as my L1, right? But this is going to be served well with my L1 without worrying about paying for all of my additional capacity on the cases where it's not being used. I pay for it at design time, pay for it, you know, the building of the machine, but I'll pay for it at runtime. Well, except for power. I can remember. And finally, Baz appears to take uh, as much cash as you can possibly give it, right? So your L3 will be as much as you can afford, right? So then you have a machine where Foo is going to run basically perfectly. Bar is going to run almost as well as it could possibly run. And uh, Baz, right, is, is going to, you know, run as well as you can afford. So you can see that if you have different needs, right, then you can capture these different scopes of localities, different sorts of access patterns better with a multi-level cache right, than you can for any one level of cache that you're trying to optimize across lots of different programs. Now I'll go one step further and claim that you don't even have to think that Foo, Bar, and Baz even necessarily need to be different programs. Right? Real programs have phases of behavior. Right? So if I have a portion of my program where I am you know, sorting uh, some set of data. It has locality that looks in a, you know, it will exhibit particular locality patterns. If then after I've sorted it, I then go walk a graph to get some more data, that will look very different than the portion that was sorting. If I'm looping back and forth between these two, then at some sort of you know, higher level even, there's a, a, a series of, of phases of low, high, low, high locality, and so forth. Right? So real programs have lots of internal structure over time uh, and across data structures. So this optimization here, even if you were running a single program, uh, is still going to play out if you are looking across time in the use of data access patterns within your program. So uh, multi-level caches aim at good stuff. Okay. Everyone follow why uh, multi-level is going to do much better than, than uh, just having one, right? Okay. Okay, so uh, we've taken some of this for granted. Uh, that uh, you're going to have a split L1 just to resolve the structural hazard of fetching an instruction and doing a memory access in the same cycle. Um, but uh, you can apply the same uh, question you have here about split versus unified at every level of your cache hierarchy. Uh, it doesn't even have to be necessarily symmetric, right? Uh, you can imagine, I don't know why you would want to do this, but you could do such a thing. Right, where this is your L1D, uh, L2D, L2U, L1I. Right, you can have a hierarchy that looks like this. Right, you can connect these together however you want. Right, you've got options. Right, uh, I don't have any design that does this, but I do know of designs uh, that have done this, where I have a split where my unification doesn't happen until my L3. Uh, the Itanium in particular, because the types of uh, software it was targeting had very large instruction footprints, and so an L2 iCache was actually actually useful for, say, database process processing. Okay. Now, when you're splitting these other levels of your hierarchy, you're not really that concerned about low-level pipeline structural hazards of accessing you know two pieces of memory at the same time, right? Um, what you're more concerned about is, uh, are there fundamental differences in either the capacity uh, requirements, or either, either working sets, uh, or the access patterns that you can exploit, i.e. all of the itanium, uh, versus the utilization of the resources you have spent for cash. 
right? So if you think of that from a queuing theory perspective, right? You want to maximize utilization, you put everyone in one queue. You know, take all your, pull all your resources together, everyone, everyone shares, and you'll get maximum use of all that cash that you paid for. Um, but that isn't necessarily what you actually always want. If you're willing to forego a little bit of utilization, leaves things a little bit underutilized, you might get better uh, value out of these specialized resources that you have. You will just have spent more on SRAM cells that are not always maximally used. Right? So depending on what you're limited by at the time, right, you'll make different decisions. Right, so if you are in anything in the recent memory where this level of uh, investment for a microprocessor scale, uh, you know, commercial microprocessor scale is, is pretty negligible, then you're gonna split it not based on utility, you're gonna split it based on uh, what, what value proposition, what specialization it gives you. If you're building a microcontroller, then maybe you still say, look, you know, uh, I wanna make this thing four cents. So, you get one level of cash, everything's shared, and good luck with that, right? Because I'm not, I'm not paying for any more SRAM. So we still do get some interesting decisions there. Okay. Uh, we'll come back to uh, this, this in just a second uh, in terms of uh, how this plays out in multi-core. Um, but again, right, optimizations here more for miss rate. The more you get on here, the optimizations more for uh, access time. Uh, so again, there are other ways you can uh, try to specialize what type of cache you are you are building and how you are uh, how you are carving up your hierarchy. Right. So here are some examples. Right. So again, uh, this was sort of the uh, model that started in two thousand eight and went through. Uh, I want to say at least twenty twenty or so. It's a good twelve years of uh, of this model. So. Um, Private L1, private L2, shared L3, right? So with multi-core, you're not just sharing necessarily among these split L1s. Again, each of these is actually a pair of L1s into a unified uh, L2, so L1i, L1d. Actually, I haven't even broken up the, the, the red boxes there for the split. Um, but you've got options, right? So here, uh, there's an older design, right? So pairs of L1s into an L2, L2 directly in the memory bus. Uh, here you have pairs of uh, L1s into an L2 into a shared L3. Here you had private L2s. Uh, pick your flavor. Someone has tried it, right? Your modern performance versus efficiency cores. The efficiency cores on Intel machine are, are sharing some, some larger L2 resources asymmetrically versus your performance cores, which get a more private L2. You know, so it's, there is no right design. Right. There is, uh, at best, a right design for the technology plus workload that you expect to be running. Right. Um, so let me give you a different example. Um, have people ever heard of a company called Tylera? Okay. So Tylera had a 100-core chip 15 years ago. Right. Long time back. Um, was it 15? I think it was about 15 years ago. Um, now, obviously, these were not uh, very impressive cores. Right? These were little tiny, uh, very, very simple cores. But they all had their own uh, private L1, L2, and they all talked to memory separately. They didn't share anything because the Tyler model for a workload was you will run 100 independent processes. Right? There's no reason for them to share any data. Uh, their only thing they're going to share is off-chip memory bandwidth. We're going to stick this in very, very particular server markets, in, in racks of these machines, and uh, our, our niche clients will use them, and we're not selling to anyone else. Right? Whereas if you look at, um, you know, if you're running a, a parallel program, you would like this versus this. I don't want to share my data through memory. I want to share my data on chip if I can. I want there to be pathways of communication. So again, your mileage will vary. Okay. Okay, so when we start thinking about uh, interesting complex hierarchies, we need to sort of go sort of revisit some of our, our decisions about how we want to run our, our cache in the policy space. So if I have 
uh, a, an update to a value that I have cached. Right? Again, from a correctness perspective, all you really need to know is that the next time I request that value from that address, I get the up-to-date version. But when I want to propagate it is a policy decision. Right? There are lots of ways to make that correct. Okay. So the, the simplest option is to, when you update it in one level of cache, just immediately send it to the next. Right? Everything will be consistent. Everything will have the same version of that value. Right? There will be no con potential confusion or complication as to which version of you know, uh, some, some cache lines value that you're actually going to get when you request it subsequently. Right? Um, now, obviously, there's a cost to that. Or you do write back. Right? I am going to delay telling anyone else that this write has occurred. I'm going to locally track that my version of this cache line is more up to date than everyone else's and make sure that when this cache line uh, leaves my cache, right, I need to make sure that the other versions of this are updated. Again, depending on the shape of your hierarchy, there are some other implications. Right? So even think about this hierarchy right here. Let's say that I have some self-modifying code in this hierarchy. So somehow I write a series of values here and need to read them back here. There is no actual connection here, right? So these, these tens of designs will tend to have uh, explicit flush and synchronization mechanisms to make sure that these caches are kept in sync with each other. Um, if your ISA is sufficiently ancient, then you somehow have to do this directly with your coherence protocols. Um, good luck with that. Intel actually allows cross-thread uh, modification of code. It's hilariously awful. Okay. So, not a whole lot of metadata for write back, um, but there is some additional machinery, right? So all I need to do to understand whether my cache line has been updated is to have a bit that says you've been updated. Right? So one bit per cache line is not an enormous amount of data, metadata to keep track of, not so bad. Uh, it does mean that I now have asymmetric behavior on replacement. So if I replace a clean block, very simple. I drop it on the floor, right? Whatever version is there in the rest of the system is up to date, I need to do nothing, we're good. If it's dirty, I need to initiate a data transfer. Now, I probably don't want to stop the world, right? Because uh, again, you know, uh, I just had a replacement, which means I just had a miss, right? I want to stop the world, do this right back, uh, then be ready to actually handle the miss that every LNS is urgently waiting on, right? So I'm going to add a buffer. So in a write back cache, right? I'm going to say, okay, great. Um, I will write this back into this buffer that will eventually be written back into the next level of cache. And then as soon as it's in this buffer, I can declare my local resource free for new data to be written into to resolve uh, whatever access caused this eviction in the first place. Right? I want to overlap as many of the parts of this uh, you know, non-hit case as I can. Right, so I want to overlap the eviction with the fetching of the new line to do that buffering. Okay. In terms of terminology, right, uh, fills are our requests to, to, to bring something in. Right, so I'm going to have this miss. I don't have it. So I'm going to send the fill request on at the same time that I'm pushing into the right buffer. Right, um, and then new block arrives, puts in the cache. This will happen eventually. When will happen? I don't know. Now, the fact that it doesn't mean that uh, it, uh, it hasn't necessarily happened yet means that there's another interesting thing that could happen. So what could happen that makes step one uh, entail some work other than just talking to the next level cache? What else does step one also have to do? What is my, my, so remember, I'm, I'm writing it back because I had a replacement. I had a replacement because I had a miss. I want to resolve my miss. I want the most up-to-date version of this line. 
Where could that line be? There are now two places that it could be. It could be in the next level cache or the rest of the hierarchy they're on, or it could be in the right buffer. So when I check the next level cache, I actually also need to check that the data is still pending to be written into the next level cache. In the same way that your store buffer, right? So I write, a, I do a store in, in, into memory. The data could be in memory or it could still be sitting in the store buffer when I do a load. Here, right? Let's say I've got a very uh, nasty ping pong pattern where I'm just evicting, 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 same pair of lines, right? It can still be sitting there in the right buffer. I have to check it. It doesn't necessarily, uh, hasn't necessarily actually gotten to the next level of cache yet. Okay. So I do have to actually be able to check this in parallel with sending this fill request. Uh, if, if I want to, I don't want to serialize that because I don't want to have the right buffer check necessarily on my critical path uh, out to, uh, to fulfilling the miss. Um, so I do need to be able to have a state machine that is keeping track of enough data to realize that it has sent a request, fulfilled the request already, and is actually going to ignore whatever this sent back to it. Uh, in practice, I am going to want to issue these in requests in parallel and just ignore one of them. Right? Even though these are very asymmetric in cost, right? it's going to be much cheaper to check my right buffer than just to go all the way to the next level of cache. Uh, but from a timing perspective, I probably want to do it. Right? If my right buffer were sufficiently small and local, and this was sufficiently far away, maybe I serialize it. Again, design choice. Right? You have options. Okay. Now, right through is simpler. Uh, you don't really need to deal with any of that. I mean, you still need some, some buffering and practice because these things don't just take one cycle. Um, but the, the, the fundamental challenge with write through is maybe from here to here, write through is fine. Right? Your L1, your L2, they're, they're both local to your core, they're very tightly coupled. You, know, you maybe have dedicated access wires here, you're not even doing any arbitration. At most, you're arbitrating the L1i, L1d. You know, go ahead. Um, but I probably don't want to be writing through, I'm definitely not writing through all the way to main memory, right? Again, think about the fundamental bandwidth problem here, right? So let's say that I can do, right? Again, it's good to have back of the envelope order of magnitude models sitting around in your head. If I can do two stores per cycle, quite reasonable, right? At uh, 64 bytes per cache line, Right, is what I'd have to be uh, potentially sending. Because again, I'm, I'm sending cache lines here. I'm not sending individual datum that, I, that I've written. Right, so if I want to send two 64 byte cache lines every cycle at, uh, let's keep it to powers of two, uh, four gigahertz, I don't want to be having that anywhere near main memory. Stupid amount of bandwidth. So at some point in your hierarchy, you will definitely have some write back, at the very least between uh, your last level of cache and main memory. Uh, in practice, um, you may have write back at every level of your cache. Uh, in a modern design, uh, you will at most have write through between your L1 uh, and your L2. Right? It's about as much as you can afford. Right? Uh, but even there, it can actually uh, you know, simplify some of your logic. Again, think back to the interaction with inclusivity, right? So if I have a small L1 optimized mostly for hit time, I don't want it interacting with other complex protocols, right? So I want to keep it as simple as humanly possible. So my L1 is just right through into the L2. I push all the complexity that I can to the L2 in the more uncommon case, right? I can I declare victory and you know, unfurl the banner accordingly. So you're definitely going to have write back anywhere that you are bandwidth limited. You'll definitely have write back anywhere that you are very energy conscious, right? Um, because this write amplification issue, right, is actually a real big deal. Um, this becomes even more important if you think about uh, emerging alternative memory technologies, right? So SRAM 
is basically symmetric for read and write in as, a, as a technology, and I can write it an effectively indefinite number of times, i.e. by the time that your SRAM has worn out, so has every other part of the logic on your processor, and that's not the point of failure you're worried about. Right? If you're using a non-volatile memory technology like MRAM, RERAM, FERAM, right? Uh, it's not the case. PCM, those are other things about there. So, you know, those, instead of having something like, you know, 10 to the 17th, 10 to the 18th, you know, write cycles before you start worrying about aging, those might have values as low as, say, 10 to the 9th. Right? So you really, really, really do not want to be writing a non-volatile memory repeatedly. Um, this will come up uh, more often in practice and something can buy today with something like your SSDs, right, than with something in memory. But uh, have you ever heard the phrase storage class memory? No? Still to the bleeding edge for you? Okay. Um, so how many people have ever heard of Optane? Okay, a couple of people have heard of Optane at least. Yes, I know. They canceled it. It's dead. Uh, Intel likes to do that. Um, but there was a period of time where you could go and buy a non-volatile memory for your main memory for your machine. Uh, it definitely was very, very sensitive to, uh, to what we call write amplification. Right? So uh, this does actually come up in practice in things you're actually optimizing in real, real designs. Uh, it's not purely an esoteric uh, exercise in the enormous design space of all possible policies you can imagine. Right? Uh, you do actually care about write back and write through. Okay, so if we look at how this is all sort of uh, uh, set up then, um, so there's another interaction here which has to do with uh, write allocation, right? So if I have a uh, write allocate cache, then um, everything in this, everything that I push in here from the store buffer is going to require a cache line. And then uh, the only thing I need here is a write back buffer. If I have a no write allocate, or if I have, and here's another fun thing about the, the, the realities of things, um, some instructions actually are inherently cache bypassing. So no matter what your write back or write through policy was, they don't care. Uh, they're gonna effectively act like write through. And in fact, they're gonna like, act like write through no allocate and just go straight through the entire memory hierarchy. Uh, some of that is done for I.O. because I.O. isn't actually memory. So I don't want to cache, you know, uh, writing a piece of data to an external device. That's not how that really works. Uh, some of it is also done because you just happen to know things about your particular pattern. You code it that way. But um, for a variety of reasons, right, or any sort of interaction with the no allocate policy, uh, some of these stores might be actually just bypassing through the cache and through the store buffer. Then you've got the lines that are coming back because they're evicted. Uh, do I need to handle these fundamentally separately? No. I'm going to merge those all into one combined structure that handles things that are both flowing through the cache directly and that are being evicted from this cache. So we are not going to uh, overly think about uh, exactly what's going on in, the, in that buffer, whether it came from a, a, a store that is bypassing or right through, or whether it is uh, being an evicted line. Uh, as far as we are concerned, all that matters is there is some set of word or byte-sized updates coming here, and then a set of cache line-sized transactions uh, that are, are being, being entailed there. All right, so the interface is going to be unified to be cache line level here to here, even if we're only asking it to do an update of a word or a byte from a, a write-through uh, write policy. Skip over that. Eh, okay. So, right, right mishandling. Okay, so uh, probably should have done this in the opposite order. Apologies. So, uh, if you think, so there are different, different ideas about your workload and your expectations as to which of these will be better. Uh, again, there isn't a singular right answer. Right. So imagine that my computation is reading a bunch of inputs, producing a separate output structure, 
uh, that will then much, 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 much later in time be you know, consumed by someone else, or maybe it's my final output. So if that's the case, right, what is the value in caching my outputs, caching my stores? Uh, beyond the level of like a single line buffer, right? So that I'm doing cache line level transactions up the, up the rest of the chain, basically zero, right? I have no reuse. Now let's imagine a very different scenario. I have some, let's say I have a B plus tree and I am manipulating it. I'm reading it, I'm writing it, I'm reading it, I'm writing it. I am reading and writing a structure in memory. Yes, I would like to actually cache all these writes that I'm doing, right? So. Uh, right allocate is, is your friend in, in a lot of common cases, but it's not always what you want, right? Again, these also have some pairings with some other design decisions. Uh, as, as you will have noticed, almost none of these things are orthogonal, right? So there is a large design space, but not all of these combinations are actually good together. Right? So some of them have natural uh, correlations. Okay, so again, we can come back to this. We've seen this before. So we're we're comparing. Uh, these are these are of the of basically the same uh, same time frame, you know, circa two thousand eight, right? So you know, ARM Cortex eight, Intel Nehalem. And again, you want to get a sense of um, what we're doing that's historically interesting and what we're doing that's still going to be relevant. That's going to be even more important when we go to some of the advanced optimizations. Right, so when we look, for instance, at you know the victim caches, which were originally proposed in the you know, early 1980s, um, it's useful to remember how associative the modern designs actually are. Okay. So L1 replacement, uh, you'll note that no one uses actual LRU. Uh, it turns out that random replacement is actually not terrible in practice. Let's have a bit rotates around through, kick someone out. It's not terrible. Approximate LRU is a little bit better. It's a little more expensive. Actual LRU, too expensive. Right again, here was your 32, 256, 8MB, right? You can see the associativity uh, climbs in general. At least doesn't go down. So you go eight way to eight way to 16, right? The further out in my system I go, the less I'm worried about hit time, the more I can spend on associativity, the more I'm going to try to optimize for the miss. Again, here you had 4, 10, 35. Uh, you flip that around to a few about four years later, right? You can see that the same sort of pattern was still there. Uh, only thing really changed went from four way, eight way to eight way, eight way. Uh, some of this uh, we will come back to is uh, interaction with the virtual memory system as to why they've made it as associative as they have. But we'll we'll hit that in a, in a later set of slides. Okay. So. You can take a look at the global miss rate. So here we're not looking at the, so previously in that A map, we showed you the local miss rates. Here we are now looking at the global miss rates. So it's useful to make sure you're talking about the right thing. So again, even though our L2 had a higher local miss rate, it was reducing the total miss rate through the entire cache hierarchy. Same property going on here. So if you look at a, a range of different benchmarks, so these are spec 2000 energy benchmarks. Uh, these actually happen to be operating in this particular case on the smallest possible data set. So this is not even indicative of, uh, uh, of, their, of their, their broader activity. Um, but you can see you know, locality being captured at different scales. So here with GZIP, I think about 8% of the accesses were missing in the L1, but almost none of the accesses missed in both the L1 and the L2. Uh, similarly here for MCF, um, you know, nearly 25% of the accesses were, were missing in the L1, but you know, less than 5% were missing both the L1 and the L2. Again, this is for the smallest data set, right? So if someone tells you global miss rates, it's a very different meaning than the, the local. Uh, again, you can sort of reverse engineer with this two level cache what this local miss rate must have been, right? Again, if this was say, you know, 24% uh, were, were misses, right? Then of those, right? Uh, I only got, uh, you know, it's not a 90, you know, 6% here. It's uh, only reduced this by about a factor of five. So probably about 80% we're hitting, right? 
You can figure those out. Uh, you can see this in an L1, L2, L3. This is actually for a, the full size set of benchmarks. So these are not directly cross comparable. Uh, but you can see the sort of same thing happening overall, where you can sort of measure the utility of the different levels of your cache hierarchy, how much they're contributing. Um, so in particular, if you look at the L2 global miss rate, right, you can see that for some of these, even just the L2 has already gotten us almost all the value we were going to get. right? Whereas for our good friend MCF, those buses are not going to schedule themselves. Uh, our good friend MCF, uh, even your, your uh, full scale, even with the L L3 thrown at it, right? Uh, it still hasn't fully, uh, fully resolved our, our cache misses. Now again, get still back in the right, right set of mind scale for, 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 uh, for orders of magnitude. Modern misses to main memory, right? What is this? What does this represent here, right? Should I care about a 5% global miss rate? Uh, yes, right? Because it's going to take hundreds of cycles to resolve, right? Again, if I am a four gigahertz machine and it takes me 60 nanoseconds, right? So you get that data back from DRAM. That's a pretty good, uh, a pretty good latency, in the grand scheme of things, right? If five percent of the time I experience two hundred and forty cycles of miss, that's still a very, very heavy weight at the end of that lever, right? Again, that's why MCF is our good friend that everyone hates. One likes MCF. Everyone, everyone loves, loves SGEN. SGEN's great. Okay, so global versus local. Where are we? We got time. 40 minutes. Okay. So, how can we go further? Um, so, we, we, we know that caches, as we have described them so far, are demand based structures, right? They have in them, Going back to your three C's, right? They, they only have in them things that we have asked for. Well, that's a lie. Uh, cache is a resource I can exploit. A cache can have in it whatever I have arranged to have in the cache, right? I don't have to actually wait for you to ask for something to put it into the cache. It's microarchitectural state. The hardware can try to be clever. So we already do a very minimal form of spatial prefetching in the form of having, um, you know, say, 64-byte blocks that we're transferring things around in in our cache. But you can go further. You can bring in entire cache blocks that you have not requested at all. Right? So we're going to speculate in our cache system. Yet another predictive structure. Good times. Okay. So can we figure out where we are going to miss in memory and bring that data in uh, before we access it? And the answer is sometimes. Okay. And that's uh, hopefully going to be going to be good enough. Now, if you are already using all of your off-chip memory bandwidth, or you are already using any other bandwidth bottleneck in your machine, prefetching is not your friend. Doing additional speculative work when you don't even have enough time to do the work you already need to do uh, is not a good way to, to organize your, your, your system. Uh, on the other hand, if you are unable to utilize all of the bandwidth that is available, you know, uh, then this is a good way to leverage an idle resource and turn it into something of value. I can take spare bandwidth and turn it into prefetch resources. Right. Now, um, there's some very simple cases that are going to turn out to be pretty easy to figure out. Imagine, if you will, that I am multiplying two matrices together. Right? If you've ever run PyTorch, congratulations, you've multiplied lots of matrices and lots of vectors together. Right? It will turn out that the way you lay out a matrix or vector in memory is, well, sequential. Right? It's a big array. It's just a big sequential array of bytes. 
So if I'm currently accessing A of I, and then A of I plus one, and then A of I plus two, and then A of I plus three, right? So on, so on, so on, and so forth. Hopefully, it should not be too hard to figure out what the next block in the cache that you're going to access is, if you are literally stepping at a fixed increment for a very, very long time, right? That should be a predictable behavior. Uh, other than data accesses, this also turns out to work reasonably well in, in, in a little bit more in the small for instructions, right? You tend to have fairly linear access patterns uh, within at least portions of your, of your instructions. Now, uh, if your code is branchy, right, this isn't going to quite work. Uh, but the, if your code at least has reasonable coverage on both sides of that branch, right, then uh, it will still end up being useful data to have grabbed, right? Now, there's another little bit of a trick here, and we'll talk about the, the, the particular metrics we want to use. Um, I don't want to prefetch too late. I don't want to prefetch too, you know, too soon. So if I prefetch too late, I won't be able to cover the latency of getting the data, right? So if it takes me 240 cycles to get the data, uh, and I you know, initiate the prefetch one cycle before I would have asked for it, that's not really going to solve my, my problem. 239 and 240 are basically the same number. Um, on the other hand, if I asked for it today and I don't need it until next Wednesday, uh, well, there's some other things that are going to be a little bit problematic. Okay, so the right way to look at these is with the three metrics of timeliness, coverage, and accuracy. So how many people are, people are familiar with precision recall curves? PR curves? Okay, well, uh, that's what coverage and accuracy happen to, uh, uh, happen to relate to, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So again, timeliness has to do with Making sure that the data that you fet that you that you wanted is there before you request it, then the prefetch has succeeded. It has covered all of your miss latency. All right. So the data has shown up in your cache before you asked for it. You're good. All right. If you fetch it too far in advance, well, again, go to the go to the extreme. Right. And it's very easy to imagine why this wouldn't work. Imagine that I want to prefetch everything that I am ever going to access. Note that the set of all things that I'm ever going to access for most programs of interest is larger than my cache. It is a problem, right? So I don't want to have fetched things that are so far in the future that they preclude me having useful to me now data in front of me, right? Okay. Coverage and accuracy are the, the metrics about how much uh, you are able to take advantage of prefetching, the effectiveness of your prefetching. Uh, with respect to whether you're prefetching um, the right data. So coverage is of all the misses that you would have had, how many of them did you actually issue a prefetch for? Um, now, again, uh, you can make coverage arbitrarily high. I'm going to prefetch all of memory. Okay, great. I have definitely issued a prefetch for everything I was going to miss on, because I issued a prefetch for all of memory. Uh, this is equivalent to, again, recall, if you're familiar with prison recall, right? So, so great, yeah. Um, I can make my coverage as high as I want to, but that's not a very good idea because the accuracy, if I prefetched all of memory, would be basically zero, right? So this is a trade-off, right? On the flip side, if I issue exactly one prefetch and it's right, my accuracy is 100%, and my coverage is basically zero. Of the billions of things that I missed on, I got one of them right. Go me, I'm accurate, but, um, you know. So if I have a lower accuracy, I am wasting resources. I could be evicting useful data. I got to store the data somewhere, right? So I have fetched this at the expense of something else I got to store. Uh, or I have uh, consumed bandwidth that would have been more useful uh, serving my, my demand accesses, right? So I can, if I'm willing to be a little more more inaccurate, I can be more aggressive and get better coverage, right? So this is the balance. I wanna be aggressive enough to get enough coverage that prefetching matters, right? While being bounded by how accurate my prediction can be so that I'm not grabbing useless junk. 
All of this while trying to figure out when I should have done it so that uh, the right data that I would actually be needing uh, is there at the right time. So uh, I assure you that uh, pretty much every machine you have probably ever owned that you thought of as a computer has hardware prefetching, right? Uh, a little bit can go a reasonably long way. Uh, how complicated the prefetcher got? Again, we're talking about simple stride prefetcher, next block prefetcher. Right? These are probably pretty easy to imagine. Could you, as everything else, throw machine learning at it? Yes. Have people thrown machine learning at it? Yes. Uh, are we going to describe exactly how that works? No. <laughs> Uh, we're not going to talk about how to use a multi-layer perceptron to try to understand you know, complex you know, patterns of pre uh, It's a pattern. You can try to learn it. You can try to predict it. Uh, your, your hardware budget uh, you know, will determine what you want to do. Right? Uh, part of the reason you don't really need to think about this is, again, depending on your workload, that may be really, really unnecessary. Right? Again, if your workload is multiplying large matrices together, a 1980s level predictor is already like you know 90% of, of what you could be asking for. Right? So the rest of your gains are being kind of small. Right? If you want to understand you know, uh, complex graph traversals and which things you're gonna, yeah, 1980s isn't gonna work. Right? Next block is not gonna figure out where you're going in a graph. Right? But what matrices is good enough. Okay. So, so in addition to the actual requests, uh, now, here's another fun thing. Where do you put your prefetch logic? What's the recurring phrase? You have options, right? So, uh, and I'm going to build, depending on my trade-offs and, and the relative expensiveness of different resources between accuracy and coverage, I'm going to build the, pre, uh, the prefetchers a little differently depending on where I put them. I'm going to have a prefetcher, and you almost certainly do, a prefetcher right here, right? That's prefetching from main memory. Now. These accesses are very expensive. This bandwidth is precious, right? So I am going to be leery of being overly aggressive unless I have a pretty good idea that I'm going to have a good access pattern that I'm really capturing here. All right, so this is going to be a less aggressive prefetcher to some degree uh, with respect to issuing them to the main memory. This bandwidth is its primary constraint. I've got lots of space to put them. My L3 is large. Right? I'm not worried about you know, polluting my L3. It's large, most of it doesn't get access too often anyway. Right? I'm worried about running out of bandwidth. I'm worried about the energy cost. I'm worried about other, other things of oh, traversing this link. L1, L2, uh, different issue, right? So uh, my L1, L2, it's pretty cheap to do an L L2 to L1 prefetch. My big issue is I can't make too many of them or else I have no room in my L1, right? So. Uh, I, I, I'm really worried about trying to amp coverage up too much here. So here I want, I want coverage as long as I'm accurate. Here I want accuracy as, as long as I have a little bit of coverage. It's a priority shift a little bit. You build slightly different prefetchers. Would you have both? Yes, you would have both, right? Not necessarily L1 to L2, but L2 to L3. Right? You can put prefetchers at every point in your machine that you can think of. You could be putting prefetchers. Okay. So stride-based sequential prefetching is sort of the generalization of uh, next block prefetching. So that's basically how you deal with uh, A, the fact that maybe you're not doing a stride through a row, maybe you're doing a stride through a column, right? So there's a fixed distance between your accesses into memory. It may not be literally you know, a block length of one, it might be a block length of n blocks, it's fine. Uh, again, anything here that is uh, looks like linear algebra, stride-based sequential prefetching is going to work really, really well. Um, you're going to want to do n blocks ahead uh, to get the right timeliness. Right? Again, if you're fetching the thing that you're about to miss, you can't cover that 240 uh, you know, cycles of latency. Once you discover that this is a repeated pattern that you are doing, though, you can start making this go away by fetching further and further down the, down the vector. There are more complex structures, even without going to uh, you know, more, more modern uh, machine learning approaches. We're using uh, tabular uh, approaches for non-sequential strides. Uh, there are uh, things known as 
Uh, they're called sensor. They're called. Um, oh, sorry, terms from falling out of my head. Uh, locality, locality where prefetchers. Anyway, they're they're they're, they're a whole huge families of of, of prefetchers. Um, so they're yeah. Uh, which will basically look at a temporal series of accesses and fetch all of the things that were near a miss. Right? So if you have some particular data pattern where you're grabbing fields from multiple different data elements, which have a fixed relative offset to each other, and you're doing that at multiple points in your structure, or if, say, you're doing a stencil operation across some, some matrix or graph, uh, those, can be, those can be very useful. These can be as complex as you want them to be. Right, so uh, we're not going to, uh, I'm not going to ask you to understand anything more than that. This I think you should be able to understand. If I have a block that is a fixed distance, I should be able to figure that out, right? I understand the rest of this is, is, is possible, right? Now, uh, you have more decisions to make. When do I actually issue the prefetch? Do I issue the prefetches based on references? Well, if I'm building my prefetcher into my L1, then I know what the reference stream is. If I'm building my prefetcher into the L3, uh, I assure you, the L3 has no idea how many times you are making requests to your L1. Right? I can't see the reference stream out here. The only thing I'm going to see here is these misses. Right? So the only information I have at the L3 is, is, is this misinformation. This would be very difficult to do it per reference further out into the system you go. Right? The information you want is not naturally available, and you would have to push it through the rest of the system, or otherwise send out summaries. Right? It becomes uh, complicated and expensive. Do you even want to do it on every miss? Maybe your goal is to say, look, uh, if I can cut my miss rate in half, I'm happy. Right? So if every miss has a paired thing that it would go with, which is the best offset from that miss to likely get a hit, right? If I can go from 5% to 2.5%, call it a day, it's out on this big end of the lever, it's a, it's a good win. I don't necessarily need to even capture this entire stream. So you just do it for miss. Or do you initiate a process of a stream of prefetches starting from some miss pattern that continues independently on its own and is now pushing data at you rather than demanding it? So stream prefetching, next block prefetching, uh, only relevant to del one. Okay. So if you go all the way back to the P4, right? A couple of interesting things here. So spec floating point 2000, which again, does a lot of linear algebra. You got 2x improvement from hardware prefetching versus not having hardware prefetching for earthquake simulation. Dropping down to more modest things here. Of all of these spec integer benchmarks, only two of them got more than 15% improvement. Right? So if you look at the hardware prefetchers in the Pentium 4, which again are pretty much like this, right? uh, your mileage is a little more varied. Modern prefetchers can extend this benefit further over more benchmarks. Uh, you can get it a little higher. You're not going to get actually much higher in here. This is already, again, a very regular computation. So even the simple stuff already worked. There's another interesting uh, interaction here. If you look at what this was limited by. So it was an L2 prefetcher with eight streams from up to eight different 4KB pages. Why do I care about paging in my prefetching? So it'll turn out, if you uh, foreshadow what we're going to do later, uh, well, these accesses here into your L1 from your processor are virtual addresses. Um, this is all physical. So if I want to stride through my memory, um, if my structures are not allocated contiguously between the virtual and, and physical space uh, beyond the page level, there is no necessary reason to believe that if I keep striding forward, that what I am requesting is even in, well, my process's memory, uh, let alone uh, whether it is in the same data structure, whether alone it is the right actual pattern because you have uh, crossed some virtualization boundaries. Uh, so in practice, this remains to this day uh, a, a challenge with smaller pages and, uh, and uh, you know, more distant prefetching. 
if you're using two meg or one gig pages, obviously uh, less of a less of a challenge. Okay, okay. Um, almost there. All right, you can use software prefetching. Uh, I, I mentioned this previously. These are usually non-faulting. Uh, so if you can basically say, here, I'm going to ask for this. And if anything happens, uh, then just pretend it didn't. Uh, but if it, uh, if it goes through and it, it gets it into the cache, great. Right? But I'm not going to block up and uh, make the rest of the system wait. Right? I'm just basically trying to prime the cache. Uh, and there, there, if you know your particular pattern, this can be, it can be a little bit useful. Uh, you can even go so far as to do register prefetching, but then you have to understand whether the register is valid or not. Let's, let's not worry about it too much. Okay. So, as we've, as we've mentioned, um, the way that the cache serves your uh, program is subject to uh, the type of access patterns you're imposing on the cache hierarchy. So, one option is to change your data access pattern. You want to have better use of your cache? Why don't you rewrite your program to be cache friendly? Now, the challenge with this um, is you're going to have to make some assumptions about what the cache looks like uh, if you want your code to be portable at all, right? And so, unless you are doing, you know, HPC style, I am designing exactly this piece of code for exactly this particular node size on exactly this supercomputer. And I'm going to optimize it all the way down. And I'm not even going to let the compiler you know, reorder things. I'm going to do this all by hand. You know, good on you. Um, if you can only make use of fairly general properties that are going to hold right, and understandings about how caches are structured. So this is why, uh, even though we have lots and lots of compiler optimization tools, uh, optimal sub-blocking for even linear algebra, which is very, very understandable, is still a little bit of an art as opposed to just a science in terms of getting the, the parameters right uh, for, for different, uh, different machines. Uh, and there's a, a large body of work on sort of dynamically adapting some of the, these parameters in, in code transformation. Right? But some of them are, are just generally good ideas. Right? So loop fusion is fairly straightforward. Right? For i1 to n, a of i is b of i plus c of i. And then for i1 to n, d of i is e of i plus b of i. I can merge these, right? I will get better locality. I'll get better reuse of my accesses to B if my computation looks like this and it does like this, right? Because these two accesses are very far apart in time. And that's going to stress out my cache. These two accesses are very close in time. It's almost certainly going to still be there, right? If my loop is very, very, very large, right? I might have a penalty on my instruction cache for doing this. So I don't want to be doing this for any piece of code, right? But there are lots of cases, if, if it looks something like this, then this is a, this is a clear win. Where your code actually is a pair of one-liners, yeah, you want to merge them, this is better, right? If each of these is a thousand lines on its own, no, that's what heuristics are for. I can change the order of my loops. Um, so again, if you're looking at something, say, uh, you have to understand how memory is laid out, right? If I've got a matrix, it's a two-dimensional structure. My memory address space is one-dimensional. How do I lay out, how do I project my two-dimensional structure onto that one-dimensional memory space? So most of the languages you have probably used are row major, right? So that's basically saying that A of J I and A of J I plus one are laid out sequentially in memory. So a row is laid out sequentially. Fortran, column major, right? So this order, right, is perfectly reasonable for uh, Fortran. This order would be much better for C or yes. Why? Uh, it's an arbitrary decision. You can, you can, well, why ending this, right? Yeah. It's an arbitrary decision. You can, you can pick whichever one you want. Yep. Okay. And we will, we will stop there and pick up on, on Thursday.